Oh, well, thank you, Lynn. <laughs> um, it's really exciting to be here because my father uh, went to John Hopkins. He went here as an undergraduate and also he came back for an MP degree. And he loved his time here. So um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And are we going to do the battle? Why don't we do it at the very end? Okay. Unless you'd like to do Okay, um, so I have a signed copy, Christine. Um, the person in charge of career services, I saw her. Where, where is she? Oh, uh, Catherine. Catherine. Oh, there she is. Stand up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I um, have a signed copy of my book with um, Catherine, and so she's in charge of the career services. So, everybody, when you're looking for a job, um, you need to go to her and uh, talk to her about the careers, and you can read my book when you're there. So how many people here are looking for jobs? Okay, good portion. Great. All right. So what I'm going to talk about today is careers in life sciences, um, the industry dynamics, um, work-life balance careers for the women in bio, job search strategies and resume search, you know, uh, information about how to find a job, and the current economy is what I'll end with. So in the beginning. There was um, pharmaceuticals, which are chemically synthesized in the test tube, and those are called small molecule drugs, and you're all very familiar with that. And then there was biotechnology, and the biotechnology is RNA, DNA, protein, and of course you know Genentech, um, and those are called large molecule drugs. And here's where it gets confusing. So Genentech has their own small molecule departments, and Big Pharma have their own biologics departments. So now the industry is called Biopharma, or also therapeutic companies. But then it gets even more confusing. There's the biotools companies. So those are the companies that make the reagents and services for the life sciences, and that's also biotech. And then there's medical devices, which is a great industry to be in, which are instruments or software for diagnostic or therapeutic purpose. And then we have the biofuel industry, which is really hot right now, and I'm going to have a few slides about that. So I call all that together the life sciences, which is the focus of my book. Now there's another definition, which is healthcare, which is the hospital world. Um, I don't really cover that in my book, but I have a couple of slides about that. So, three main career paths. For the students here um, who have science backgrounds, here you are, student. <laughs> and so there's many careers, good careers in academia besides being a tenured professor. Um, there's education and um, program director and lo lots of uh, types of jobs. And then there's great jobs in government and nonprofits and research institutes. And then there's careers in industry. And I'm going to talk mostly about careers in industry today. So what I'm going to tell you about is kind of like my second PhD degree. What I did was an experiment. And what I did was I did a systematic assessment of all the careers in the life sciences. And unlike science, this was not hypothesis driven. This was purely a data gathering expedition. And the goal was really this book, which is a resource guide for people looking for careers in life sciences. And the goal of the book really is that people would read each chapter and find a chapter that really jives with them, what, you know, something that really interests their career, interests them in their career path. So one of the goals is really um, of the happy alarm clock, which it means that you just cannot wait to get up in the morning and go to work. You love your job so much. So the goal is really to find a job like that. And I love this quote, if you are doing what you love, then it's not really work. And then the other goal is to find, uh, to get on track, because there are so many careers in the life sciences, so really find a career that's right for you. So the methods. So like an experiment, I interviewed over 200 industry professionals, and the interviews were an informational interview uh, on the telephone, and I mostly interviewed EP-level people, mostly MDs and PhDs, and I tried to interview at least 10 people per chapter. So like a scientist, and I gathered all the data, I analyzed it, and I summarized it into my book. The entire uh, book took three years to write, and it's published by Cold Spring Harbor, Love Trade Press. So here is the exciting results of my work. So basically what you see is a phylogenetic tree. This is basically the table of contents, and each of these little lines are career areas, and I cover well over 100 different careers in the life sciences. And trust me, there are many more. 
So you start with idea, discovery research, going all the way down into R&D, project management clinical, into the commercial operations, sales and marketing, into the technical services, and into the services. So let's talk a little bit about these careers. <clears throat> so first, before I talk about the careers, we need to talk about the steps in drug discovery and development. So you start out with an idea that could be uh, in, in academia or in industry, and then the drug is uh, lead optimized, so chemistry, and then the, the good products go into preclinical studies, which is animal studies, and during that time you have continual bioprocess development, more chemistry, and then the product uh, uh, goes to an IMD filing, which is done by regulatory affairs, but regulatory affairs people are involved in the whole process, working with the FDA. Um, if the product, um, then the product goes into human clinical trials. And during that time, you have continual scale up in manufacturing, which is the bio process development uh, chapter of my book. And then if the product is successful, if you file for an NDA or BLA, it goes to the FDA, the product is launched, and then you have some marketing and sales and phase three, three B, four clinical trials, which is medical affairs. Most people don't know about medical affairs. Medical affairs is sort of a combination of marketing and clinical. So the point of this is that the biotech companies tend to be really good at discovery research all the way into clinical, and the big pharma is really good at phase three clinical trials and sales and marketing. So a lot of biotech companies license their product right about here, and then pharmaceuticals take it over from here. And another point is there's been a down economy, so there's been a recession. And when there's a recession, the companies focus on sales because money is king. And so that means that they focus on the products cl uh, closest to getting approved, which means that these areas in career-wise are hot, but the career out here, which is the furthest from sales, um, there's been a lot of layoffs. Okay, so careers and research. So what I'm showing you here is that most people, especially coming from academia, the easiest entry into the life sciences is discovery research. But what happens is once people work at the bench for a while, they get burned out, their career, uh, you know, their interests change, maybe their priorities in life change, and people move around. So once they work in uh, uh, research for a while, they decide, oh, I want to go into project management, marketing, sales, people move around. So, so, the air, so the whole industry is populated with people with science backgrounds. So how many people here love doing bench research and that's all they want to do? Oh, okay, <laughs> a couple of people. So what I've outlined here are careers where if you like to do bench research, these are the careers. But the cool thing is for all the rest of the people who didn't raise your hand, all these careers, there is no bench research and you are completely immersed in science. So you can really apply your science background and not do any bench research. Cool. Huh. Okay, business. So how many people here are interested in business? I talked to a couple of MBAs. Great. So having a business background is a big advantage. Um, and as I, I outlined here, uh, several of the careers where having an MBA will really benefit you. How about engineers? Do we have any engineers in the room? Okay. So it, for engineers, really think about medical device companies and biotools, especially devices. They love engineers. Okay, who wants to be CEO one day? Come on, <laughs> come on, you MSNBA people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So certain careers take you to become a CEO, and other ones not. So, for example, have you ever heard of somebody in regulatory affairs who became a CEO? I haven't. Um, so, what are some careers that were you can um, that are good for becoming, you know, to going up the executive management? So, project management is gray area. If you if you like all these careers and you can't decide which area you like, really think about project management because it'll give you exposure to all those careers and all, and all those areas and also it gives you great training for executive leadership. Um, let's see, see us a lot. So I did a survey and um, in pharma, the vast majority of CEOs came from, any guesses? Close. Anything? Yes, marketing and sales. The vast majority of big pharma come from marketing and sales. So if you want to be a CEO one day, marketing in particular gives you great training for executive leadership, fabulous training. 
And so in the biotech world, about half of them came from marketing sales, and the other half came from research and development. So a lot of clinical MDs and PhDs uh, in biotech. So let's see, business development. Business development is great training for a CEO because you're doing deals, and CEOs do deals with venture capitalists. In operations, the COO is usually the next person in line to become CEO. Um, venture capital, a lot of venture capitalists were CEOs and become venture capitalists and go back to being a CEO. Um, management, a lot of lawyers are CEOs because they need to articulate the message. Um, so, you know, kind of summarizing that. And who wants to earn a lot of money? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, so where is the money in the life sciences? Well, clinical development is clearly one of the biggest areas because the MDs are there. And so if an MD is a cardiologist, they are, they can, they, companies need to pay the MDs what they could earn in clinical practice. So they earn a lot of money. Sales. Sales is huge. Sales people earn huge, huge commissions. Not all of them. It's really competitive, but a lot of sales people earn big commissions. So um, if, you, if you're interested in making money, sales is the way to go. In fact, the VP of sales frequently earns as much as the CEO of many companies. Law. Uh, successful partners can easily earn a million dollars a year. Now, not everybody is a successful partner. And when you're thinking about law, there's great areas of law. People always think just patent law. But there's other really great areas of law, such as litigation, transactional law, and corporate law. So that's, those are really, really interesting areas. And litigation is really hot right now because companies have so much money. But when I did this survey, the number one vocational area that people that earn the most money was investment bankers. Which is really funny because right after that, the Lehman Brothers crashed. And most of the people I interviewed lost their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They make and more than venture capitalists. I mean, investment bankers make a ton of money. But it turns out that there's a direct correlation between stress and making money. So I have this great quote in my book. Uh, so investment bankers, it's a really stressful career. They're traveling all the time. They're making these big deals. And so I have this funny quote that says, the only two days that you can take off of work during investment banking is at your own wedding and at your own funeral. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really, really stressful career. All right, what's hot? So regulatory affairs is hot and continues to be hot. And the reason is because there's just not enough people trained in regulatory affairs. And I noticed on the website that you have a master's in regulatory affairs, which is fantastic because there's not enough schools that train people in regulatory affairs. So people usually, when they go to college, they don't think, I'm going to major in regulatory affairs. I mean, it's just like not on the radar. Um, but that, so there's a shortage of people with regulatory affairs skills. And the FDA is becoming more demanding, so there will be more regulatory affairs people. And this has been going on for probably the last five years. Not enough regulatory affairs people. So, people really concerned about job security. You know, think about regulatory affairs. It's not for everybody. You know, you have to be very, very high quality person. Um, pay attention to all the little details. Um, you know, so it's not for everybody, but if you're really interested in job security, regulatory affairs is hot. What else is hot? Well, what I'm showing you are all the applied sciences. So not discovery research, it's not hot. <laughs> sales and market. Sales is always hot. We just cannot find enough salespeople. It's a hard job. Um, you make a lot of money, but sales is, and, and then finally, bio IT is another area. So bio IT is everything from the computer scientists with an interest in the life sciences to the life scientists with an interest in IT. And there just aren't enough people that know both. So it's a really hot area. And, Everything is going that direction right now. So it's even in, I think this is an area that's really growing. So we have, have a master's in Oh, yes, yeah. right. And I met a really nice teacher. Uh, Chris Obama. Yeah, she, she had us look at. She was really nice. So anyways, that's a great career. So what's the coveted jobs? Well, marketing, everybody wants to get into marketing. It's a lot of fun. Um, there's endless potential in the career. And you're competing with the recently minted MBAs and you're competing with the sales reps because the sales people want to get into marketing. So marketing is very coveted. Business development. Everybody wants to do business development. But the reality is there aren't enough business development positions. So a small company can do you know, two to seven deals in its lifetime. 
and then we can come in and do all the deals, and we go to them. So there's just not enough deals to train people in this at the moment. But by far, the best career, and the top of the pyramid, and the most coveted is venture capital. Everybody loves venture capital because you're, you're meeting famous scientists and you're deciding which companies are going to get funded and you invest in those companies. So venture capital is by far the best, most coveted job. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is, you know, even though this is sort of abstract, <laughs> what I'm showing you are actual positions for people with a master's or a master's in biotechnology. These are direct titles. Well, right now, with your master's degree, you can entry level go into these every single one of these careers. And there's a lot of great careers in law. So um, there's the FDA, the US CDC, the working in public policy, um, and the US Patent Office. So there's lots and lots of great careers in government. So with that, there are many, many careers to choose, and they're all different. So for example, a uh, career, somebody working in discovery research is going to be very different than the person working in quality. You might both have the same science background, but it's, a, it's very different personality attributes. So it's really up to you to read about each of these careers, read and say, is this, you know, is this the same, you know, find something that aligns with your personal interests, your goals, and your pers professional and personal goals, and, you know, find a career that really matches what, what interests you. So are there any questions about that? Okay, so when you're looking for a job, most people think biotech, they think drugs, drug companies. But what I'm showing you is there are many, many areas besides just drug companies. And most people actually are applying to the, the therapeutic companies. But there's also the tools companies, so reagents, instruments, the genomics, bioIT. But then there's the services, and they're the ones that are really hungry. So um, think about the contract research organizations and the contract manufacturers. Those guys are really hungry. Because the trend right now is for companies to go virtual. And when they go virtual, they outsource. So all the service companies are really growing, and that's where there's real jobs. Then there's other biotech farm areas, such as industrial biotech, uh, veterinary companies, foundations, social philanthropy, clean tech and energy, that's really hot. Um, and then government institutions, like I said, the FDA and the CDC and the NIH. And um, working at the FDA can make you much more marketable because you understand the inner workings of the FDA. So companies really love to hire people with FDA backgrounds. Also consider medical devices. That is a, a much more stable industry. It's, um, it's, it doesn't have as good of an ROI as in, uh, biotech, but it's a much more stable industry, and they love to hire people with life science backgrounds. And then think about academia. There's lots of great jobs in academia <coughs> besides being a professor. And then careers in healthcare. There are tons and tons of great jobs in the hospital world. And there's so many, I couldn't fit them all on the slide. And the one that's really super hot is health information technologists. But in general, all the uh, technologists and technicians, these are all very area huge to know more. Okay, so when you're thinking about finding a job, you really need to align your skills, your interests, and your values. And there's where you will find your ideal job. And you should do some self-assessment, work with the career counselors. Um, Chris, Catherine, right? Yeah. Catherine, <laughs> Catherine, go, go contact Catherine, work and you know, uh, do an analysis, of uh, self-assessment, and really you know, find that ideal job. But just remember that, that uh, that's a moving target. So right now, your ideal job may be project management, but maybe 10 years from now, it might move into something else, like quality or management consulting. And so here are the basic career transition steps. The first thing is to you know, do some self-assessment, find the career that you love, do some informational interviews, make sure that that's the right career for you. And then you want to work on your resume, network and apply for jobs, and then interview. So those are the basic steps. So a little bit about the life sciences industry. Um, as I said, there's, uh, the drug development is a really risky endeavor. So. Um, during discovery research, you may screen millions of compounds, and of those, only maybe seven make it into preclinical. And of those, only one or two make it into clinical trials. And of those, one in six make it into, uh, actually now it's one in 10, uh, get approved. 
The entire process takes 15 years and over a billion dollars. So it's very capital intensive and it's a risky endeavor. And here's basically an analysis of the history of funding of the biotech industry. So Genentech was the first company to go public and that was in 1980. And it was a very, very early industry in, in, in the investor world. People threw their money at all these biotech companies and there was a proliferation of many biotech companies and most of them were here. And after that, nobody wanted to invest in the life sciences for a really long time. So then what you're seeing here is um, the dot-com era. And during the dot-com era, it was a nuclear winner for the life science. It's worse, much worse than it is now. Companies could not get funding whatsoever. Um, and then, just as the dot-com era ended, the human genome was sequenced. And this is where you get this huge blip. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the human genome, and ever since then, it's been going pretty strong. And right here is the current recession. So this is the history of the biotech industry. So why work in industry? So I interviewed over 200 people for my book, and I asked them, what is it you like about your job? And I got the same answer every time I talked to somebody. Any guesses what that answer was? To do the YouTube? Okay, that's a good one. But that was the right answer. So what is it people love? Why is it people love working in this industry? Interacting with interesting people. In the people was a big one. Mm -hmm. They keep going. That's it. Good, good. Okay, so the answer is, you know, people are working for a higher cause. It's really about finding cures for terrible, debilitating diseases. If you have friends and relatives who have cancer or diabetes or other horrible diseases, people are highly, highly motivated in the industry to develop cures for these terrible diseases. And every single person I talked to, except for maybe the best people, um, <laughs> said, said this is why they like working in the industry. Okay, so then I asked, for each chapter I asked people, what does it take to be successful in this career? And I found that the same nine things came up regardless. If it was quality, regulatory, clinical, whatever the chapter was, I got the same nine things plus a bunch of others. So any guesses what those nine qualities are to be successful in a career? Consistency, okay. Independent thinker. Independent thinker. Teamwork. Teamwork, yes. That's on my list. Good. Detail oriented, yes. What? Yeah, ambitious. Uh huh. That came up a lot. Working hard. Yep. Sense of humor. Sense of humor is in there actually. <laughs> you're doing, you're doing good. Any other guess? Yes. Communication. Yes, definitely. Any other? Okay, so interestingly enough, flexibility. Which was <coughs> pretty surprising. So what does that mean, flexibility? Um, you know, it means basically that you, um, you know, you're know, you working on five projects and your boss says, oh, no, no, work on a new one, or you need to drop things, and saying yes, um, being adaptable. Let's say you're working in a company and you're a neuroscientist and your boss leaves, and all of a sudden now you have a cardiologist. Do you learn a new field or do you look for a job? So being flexible is really key. And I just I was so surprised that people consistently said flexibility. You know, so being easygoing and going with the flow, and that's kind of really important. And that's what communication skills, as you said. Um, so, so both written and oral communication skills. And the reason is because everything is so team oriented, it's really important to speak your mind without offending the team players, or the other people on your team. So. Um, Communication skills was huge. Every, uh, almost everybody said communication. Um, being a team player, like you mentioned, because there, there's a lot of teams. Strong interpersonal skills. I can do positive advantage. She has such a humor, you mentioned. Um, being able to multitask, be, seeing the de doing the details. So do, being able to do the details that keep the big picture in mind. So the force of the trees. Having a customer point of view, that's always really important and creative problem-solving skills. So this list is really interesting because if you are looking for a job, chances are that the hiring manager is looking for these qualities. So these are the qualities of what it takes to be successful in general. From a you know, 200 person survey, these are the qualities that it takes to be successful in this career. Um, okay, so I have a little bit about life-work balance careers. And I sort of did a brief survey 
so what were the biggest, worst things that people complained about? And how many people here are interested in work like bouncers? Okay, so not everybody. So I'll kind of go fast. So the big, big problem with work like bouncers was the travel. People who travel all the time, particularly unanticipated travel. So let's say your, your son is having a birthday party and, oh, gotta go. Uh, you know, your family's getting together for your dad's anniversary, or your parents are gotta go. Um, so this stuff is really, really hard on work like bouncers. That was the biggest, worst one. The other one was stress. So having too much to do and not enough time, or doing big, huge, important decisions and not enough data, stress. Stress was really a, a common thing. Let's see, working in startups was particularly bad. And of course, at the executive level, the more higher up you are, the more stress uh, there is. All right, so travel intensive careers I outlined here, uh, particularly management consulting, investment banking is, you know, uh, business development and clinical, those were the worst. And there are lots of careers though, if you are interested in work-life balance, there's a lot of careers that really are great. They're like nine to five, you don't have to work hard. And let me tell you in particular, there's one career that's fantastic, which was technical support. So technical support, people are on the phone, they work nine to five, it's a very family-oriented work environment. People love working with technical support. And there's a lot of advantages to being in that field. So really think about that. But another one um, that was big was uh, patent agents, um, Quality is very much a nine to five job. Um, so, so there are a lot of areas where uh, you could manufacture. So there's a lot of areas if you're interested in work like balance, there's lots of areas to consider. Okay, this is a, uh, and some jobs allow telecommuting. So um, sales, field application scientists, and medical science licenses, they, a lot of them work from home. So you can have the advantage of working from home yeah, and there are also patients, a lot of patient meetings work from home. So you can do uh, work from home and you know have a nice job. So the highest ranking jobs with work-life balance related was technical support, drug safety, oh yeah, drug safety is a really good one, uh, patent agent, market research, bio IT, medical writing, human resources, and, and teaching. So here's another one. Okay. So this is kind of interesting. So this was the uh, medical marketing and media salary survey. Now, these are for people with about the average 15 years of, of work experience. So the average base salary in pharma was 135, in diagnostics it was 136, over-the-counter pharma was 123, medical devices was 126, and biotech was 144, which is kind of interesting. Um, but what's more interesting is the median male salary was 153, but the female salaries was 106, so a $47,000 difference. Now this is just from the medical marketing and media survey, so it's just one data point. Um, but I thought that was really interesting, and part of the reason was that the vast majority of the president and CEO positions were occupied in men, 75%. And that explains why there's this big difference. But I just thought, I thought that was interesting. Okay, so now let's talk about jobs. So the best way to find a job is never. There's been studies that show that 65% of people who find jobs find it through network. It is the most powerful way to find a job. So how do you network? Well, you go to local events, uh, local meetings, and I'm, I'm from the Bay Area, so I don't know the ones out here, but there's some really good ones. Um, you can go to local societies like uh, AWIS, especially the Women's Science and Women in Bio. Um, um, you know, associate, whatever area that interests you, product management, clinical research, regular trackers, there is a society for you. So go to those societies, but then also, you need to network not only in societies, but wherever you go. So I know a lot of people that got a job because they were flying on an airplane, and they sat next to the CEO, <laughs> and you're next to the know they got a job in that company. So wherever you go, when you're at the shopping center, when you're doing your laundry, when you're out, you know, network. You need to tell people, I'm looking, this is my background, I'm interested. All right, so, you know, I usually do like an hour long talk on how to network, but um, this is kind of a short version. So what are some ways to, to network? So you can network on LinkedIn. A lot of people, so how many people here on LinkedIn? Oh, so you're very, very, okay, great. So the idea behind LinkedIn is the greater your LinkedIn network, the more people you can reach. Um, so you want to link in with the Lions. Anybody know what the Lions is? They did open networker. Yeah, they call alliance. They growl. So 
Um, or else you might want to link in with power users. So people, you know, with a lot of, um, like I have over a thousand people on LinkedIn. So I'm a power user. Um, so you want to link in with them because they expand your network dramatically. But then you also want to link in with the groups. And in the groups, there are job opportunities in the groups, which is cool because you get you know, segmented and targeted to this particular audience when there's jobs. Um, you want to treat LinkedIn like a resume and have it, you know, have as much information as you can. And the most important thing is a way to be contacted. So it turns out recruiters pay five dollars to make an email on LinkedIn. And if you do not have a way to be contacted, chances are you won't be contacted. So you want to either have your email on there or a website or some way that people can contact you. Because that is the most important thing. You want if you want to be contacted on LinkedIn. Um, okay. So networking on the internet. Um, okay, I'm gonna that because we're pretty long time. You can shop for job on the internet. So like just like you would shop for um, something on Amazon, you can also go shop for job. So the great career places are Biospace and Craigslist. Those two areas are just oh yeah, it's the best. They have great jobs on Craigslist. You'd be surprised. Um, um, Careers by Take is my website, and I have a list of places that post jobs. Indeed.com and VentureLoop are for venture back companies. And then you can also go to professional societies. So let's say you're a neuroscientist. You can go to the neuroscience uh, societies, and there they're going to have targeted jobs just in neuroscience. And just about all of them post jobs. So a really great place. All right, go to the career fairs, biospace.com. Um, go visit the trade shows. The bio is the big one. It's here every other year. And people go to trade shows. They bring their resumes. They hand them out. Uh, don't <coughs> don't do it too much because um, people people don't like it. But <laughs> but you, you, people get jobs that way. As soon as you go to the trade booths and you go and you say, hey, I'm looking for a job, and here's my resume. And people get jobs. Um, okay, biotech news. So how many people are signed up with BioSpace? Okay, it's free biotech news. You want to find out who's hiring, who's firing, who got funded. You want to uh, learn what's out there. So that one's really great. And then Fierce Biotech is also really great. And then on Bio, Bio VC is all the uh, companies funded by VCs, and it's free. Uh, Nature Biotech is free. The Scientist is excellent. And Bio, of course. And these are all great resources. They're all free. Go visit your career counselors. We talked about that. Um, OK, resumes. So when a, when a hiring manager looks at a resume, they literally, they look at it, and they, we have this thing called the five seconds game. They go, shh, and they put it down. That is as fast, that's how fast they put their resume. So how do you stand out, right? That's the trick. Because the hiring managers, they're overworked and underpaid, and they have this huge stack of resumes. And so you know, how do you stand out? So um, one thing you need to do, and I, I'm only going to have a few points here, but um, make sure that it's, the resume isn't so much about your life and your history. It's about what you can do for the company. So the company has a need, and you need to show them that you have the skill sets and what it takes to be able to do the job. So what you need to do is the position's asking for these five qualities. You need to show in your resume, up front and central, I can do these five things, if you can. You know, and say, I have an expertise in this, I have expertise in that, and I have expertise. So when the, when the hiring manager looks, they go, oh, this, 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 that's what I'm looking for, get in the good pile. That is the most important thing you can do in the So what you can do is you can highlight it, uh, but basically you want to align the position specs with your skills. Okay? And also, a hiring manager looking for keywords. So tips to submitting your resume to come to large companies. So, um, I talked to the VP of HR at Genentech and I said, how do you get your resume? How do you get noticed? Because people are sending your resume, it goes into a deep regard poll, and you never hear back from the company. So how do you get it? So the first thing is you always want to have a requisition number. And the reason is because if you don't have a requisition number submitted with your resume, your resume gets shunted off to electric waste line. So you always want to have a requisition number, and you want to have a career objective. Now, this is controversial. A lot of people will say no career objective. But I've heard from HR that if you, let's say you're interested in project management, if you say I'm interested in project management, they will put your resume with the project manager in the company, right? But if you say nothing, they don't know what to do with it, okay? So it's more important, you know, it's important to have your career objective. 
even if it's not true. You just put something. <laughs> um, so you want to submit your resume to, to um, you can submit your resume as many times as you want, at Genet or not Genetic, but any large company, but make sure it doesn't go to the same hiring manager if it's a different position. So let's say you're applying for a project management position and a marketing position, you want to make sure it doesn't go to the hiring manager, the same hiring manager. Um, you want to apply directly to the company's website, but the best one is to network because employees are motivated financially to hire you. So they're incentivized to bring you on board. So the best way to get into a company is to network. Okay, foreign students. Do we have any foreign students? Okay, just a few. So I'll, um, so it's important to sh show your foreign status on your resume. And um, if you went to college outside the United States, you need to show, highlight your foreign, if you're foreign or not. Um, and another thing that you can do is, don't, um, so first off, startups do not generally have the legal resources to pay for foreigners. So I recommend applying to bigger companies and apply to companies with international presence. And also, you, what you can do is say that you're willing to pay for your legal fees yourself. Um, and that will, and so then that's, that's a concern. So if you can say you're willing to pay for your own legal fees, that'll help you. Okay, a little bit about interviewing. So the art of interviewing, first research the company. Hiring managers hate it when people come unprepared. And then you know, look at the corporate culture. Read some interviewing books so that you're, you can anticipate the typical questions that interviewers ask. So that you can, in your mind, think about how to answer these questions. Now you don't want to uh, over, over prepare. Because if you come out there with your glib and you say these cookie cutter answers, a lot of hiring managers don't like that. So they want you to talk really genuine about yourself, okay? And then what are hiring managers really looking for when they're interviewing? They're really thinking about, it's more about uh, personality. It's a gut feeling. Um, well, how would you behave during good and bad times and will you fit in, a, in the team? So again, that list of qualities that people are looking for, like being a team player, that is really important. That's what they're looking for. Okay, so the current economy. So the times are really changing. <laughs> um, so 2008 was a bad year, but 2009 was terrible. Just terrible. Um, 2010 and 11 have been a little better. There have been a lot of IPOs in 2010 and 2011, but they haven't done so well in the public markets. Uh, the public markets are really taking a beating out there, and as a consequence, limited partners are, interest, are less interested in life sciences. Um, the overall biotech sector is down, and this is pretty interesting, but social media is hot. So in the Bay Area, the uh, unemployment rate is 12.8, I think, but for tech people, it's 3.3 unemployment rate, which means basically there is no unemployment for tech. <laughs> social media is a bubble. We're in a bubble, okay? It's kind of like the dot-com era, you know? That's where we are. All right, so in 2009, there were huge layoffs, all right? So Pfizer, why is 19,500 people? But you better remember, this was a merger. And again, Berkshire and Powell, another merger, 16,000 people, a lot of layoffs. And in 2010, 43,000 big firms. So there's been a lot of layoffs. And this is probably my worst slide. <laughs> um, this is very sobering. So the unemployment rate in 2010, and this is United States, not life science, so just all jobs. And what I'm showing you is that at the beginning of each recession, it kind of bounces back for job growth, but this is the current one. <laughs> so it's, it's really been kind of a jobless, uh, it's, it's bad. Um, anyways, but I think it's getting a little better. Okay, so overall trends. So, like I said, the cost of developing products is rising, and it's becoming more and more expensive. So now it's 1.3 billion. The number of approved drugs per year are going down. Um, there's increased failure in phase three drugs. Um, the FDA is becoming much more risk averse, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And we have rapidly rising healthcare costs. So this is really sad. Return on investment for life science species was negative 1.5% in 2010. Now, 2011 has bounced back, but that's terrible because that means that the limited part, see, the VCs have to go out and raise money from new partners so that they have funds to invest in their companies. But if their fund was performed at negative 1.5, that means it's going to be really hard to get investments from new partners. 
which means the VCs don't have much money, which means they don't have much money to invest in the biotech and the, and the pharmas. Yeah, so it's, it's really not good. But it's fortunately it's returned, we bounced back. Um, so, uh, and the, yeah, so I mentioned that. All right, so another interesting industry cut is that M&As are bad for the users. So research money spent for each new drug um, accrued is uh, increasing exponentially, but there's little correlation between cost and success. There's almost no correlation. And over the, uh, the 30 mergers over the last six years did not boost productivity at all. And which means, and so there's analysis that show that the more companies there are, the more successful drugs there are developed. So M&As do not help the industry. Um, and they found that new areas of pharmacology were the most successful. So not the Me Too world, but new, new areas. So the FDA, here. <laughs> but um, they're overburdened <coughs> with added responsibilities um, and they're, they're focused on risks. Um, and so what's going on are people, uh, companies are evading FDA going to Europe. There's a new trend, okay? Um, and so then there's a significant rise in the number of drugs in Europe first, and that means the doctors in Europe are learning about the new technologies before our doctors are. And so the cost consequences of the FDA is the average review times are increasing, which makes it really difficult for um, companies to get venture capital funding because the regulatory risk is greater than it was before. Um, and the cost of regulatory affairs and consultants is going up, and a lot of people are going overseas. So some more industry trends. So, so as I say, a lot of companies are becoming virtual, um, and the smaller companies are nearly focused on fewer drugs, and genetics and biosimilars are really hot right now. But the Me Too market and the chronic market like diabetes is, is not doing well because of the FDA. The FDA is less uh, risk tolerant for drugs that are, uh, for diseases that are chronic diseases like diabetes, um, but the risk benefit uh, is, isn't as good. So um, they've been really hard on, on uh, diabetes particularly. So um, these, these, the venture capitalists are not as inclined to invest in companies now uh, for Me Too products or chronic products. That's just a trend. Could be change. <laughs> um, let's see. Me Too. Me Too. It, yeah, so a product that's very similar to another product that may be incrementally different. Okay, so what's going on at Big Pharma? So the Big Pharma has had dismal r and returns, um, and they have no, large numbers of blockbusters going up, had over $102 billion of, of drugs that are going up. And as you know, the cost of successful drugs has risen. Um, and so what's going on? So there have been some studies, and they found that it's better to invest, for the big farmers to invest in the biotech companies and use the biotech companies as their research engine. So that means that a lot of the big pharma might, might uh, cut back on the research departments and they might become, instead of R&D, search and development. And there's this trend. And as you look at, at all the big farmers, a lot of them, more and more of them are investing in biotech and relying on biotech for their new, to fill in their pipelines. And then um, big, a lot of big pharma is moving overseas, and the reason is to, per, uh, to pursue a market presence. So China is expected to be the third largest drug market in 2013, and number two in 2020. So the co big companies are going over to China so that they can be there and, and tap into this huge, huge market. And then we have growing markets in Australia, South Korea, India, Vietnam, Japan, and Russia. And of course, the cost of development is cheaper. So what's the outsourcing in impact on jobs? Well, the big one is manufacturing. A lot of the manufacturing jobs, those are going overseas, and then chemistry. But small molecule chemistry is better, easy to replicate overseas, but biologics, not so easy, because biologics is tricky. So a lot of the biologics have not gone overseas. There's a lot of, there's a trend now for clinical trials, preclinical research even, uh, and particularly IT. Those, some of those jobs are going overseas. Um, but still, um, uh, virtual companies, there's the growth of the services and consultants, and you always, in a company, you always need quality and project management. So with all that bad news, we really aren't so bad off as an industry. 
So biotech and medical devices, they have done far better than the other industries. Um, the big biotechs did extremely well. So Amgen stock went up 20% during the recession. Uh, big Pharma is cash rich. They've got tons of money. Um, it's a great time to invest if you're an investor. And a really great time to start a company because resources are really cheap. Um, and here I show that the, v the venture capitalists are funding biotech and medical devices. So this is the first quarter of 2011. So it's you know, not as important. The software was the number one uh, area that they invested, but biotechnology was second. Medical devices was third. And energy was, what is it, six. And uh, that went down, it used to be up here. And in fact, biotech and software were kind of even for a long time. So the venture capitalists are still interested in the life sciences. And here's an interesting slide. So here's funding by location for just 2011. But what I'm showing you is the DC Metroplex area did really well with 136 million um, in the first, the second quarter of 2011. And I looked and I did some research and there's a company, anybody work in a company called Novo Song? Novo Song is a diagnostic company. They raised 24 million. Series F is a, a diagnostic company. But there's more because there's 136 million invested in uh, the DC area. So that's good news for you. <laughs> But by and large, uh, the big areas are Boston, San Diego, and San Francisco are the big areas. Uh, hot growth protect, uh, potential sectors, um, healthcare always, generics. Biofuels is really hot. So where do you think the biofuel companies, where are they recruiting from? They're brand new industry. They're recruiting from the life sciences. So uh, like fermentation, bioreactors, plant genetics, uh, uh, chemistry, a lot of great companies that are recruiting from the life sciences for those careers. Personalized medicine is really hot. Um, campaign diagnostics, combination therapies, multiple therapies, so like Gilead um, has the HIV drugs, and they made one pill instead of a cocktail. You take them one pill. Um, and combination therapies can be really huge. Right now, we're not doing combination therapy. But once you approach uh, diseases from multiple perspectives, um, you're more likely to get confused. Another one that's really hot is um, healthcare IT. So the idea is in the future, you're going to go to, instead of going to your doctor, you go to Walmart or Costco, they take a blood sample, and then they send the results to your cell phone and to your doctor. And everybody's talking about, everybody has a cell phone. So cell phone technology is really hot. Okay, so for the IT people, <laughs> Just about every single area, every single vocation area, there's a trend to transfer data to electronic capture. And the life science has suffered from way, an overabundance of too much data, particularly for the next generation too much data to handle. So bio IT is really hot. Um, I'll skip that. So where are the jobs? So there's a lot of jobs in IT because of the stimulus package. Um, a lot of professors got a lot of money. Um, research institutes, successful biopharmas, the service companies, like I said, uh, biofuels, personal medicine, but really where I hope the real job return is in small venture back companies. And then hospitals, so that's a big market. And here's an interesting uh, report, Monster Report on Biotech Jobs in 2011. And they showed that the job postings in biotech was a positive in 2011, which is good. And the hottest area, and this is monster, okay, but the hottest area was clinical lab techs and technicians. And the areas where they're hiring the most was Texas, North Carolina, Kentucky, and DC was low, and Virginia was medium. But that's monster. So monster just is in the lower level. Okay. Um, so the future of life sciences remains very promising. We still have significant unmet medical needs for horrible diseases, all the neurological diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. We still need drugs for these diseases. And so any company that can develop drugs is going to make more money. Um, people are living longer. We have an aging population all over the world. So the market for drugs is going to get bigger. There's a huge market opportunity in China, India, and other emerging the energy could be huge, right? So, my recommendations for the folks looking for jobs is to really think about um, non-glamorous jobs because it gets you in the door, and then once you're in the company, you might like the job, or you can move around. 
So really look for non-glamour shops. Look for temp to hire contract opportunities. Um, there's safety in the hubs, so that if you, let's say, lose your job, you can keep find a new job. So the safety areas are San Francisco, San Diego, and Boston. Um, start a company <laughs> and start networking as soon as you can. So when we find your niche, find out where you can have the biggest impact and really you know, find a really satisfying uh, and productive career in the life sciences. So some great industry books that I can recommend. Science Lessons is great by uh, Gordon Binder. He's the former CEO of Amgen. He talks about the corporate culture of Amgen. It's a really, really great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, Put Your Science to Work by Peter Fisk is good. Um, if anybody interested in clinical, um, Rebecca Anderson basically took my clinical chapter and delved in and used the same formula that I used in my book and wrote a whole chapbook on careers in clinical. It's very good. Um, Non-traditional careers for chemists and alternative careers in science, they're all very good. And books for women in business, How Men Think, really great. <laughs> That's a really, really great book. Um, brag the art of tuning your own horn without blowing it. Um, Mothers on the Fast Track was, was written by a graduate dean at UC Berkeley. Uh, let's see. Books for dealing with difficult people. The Dance of Anger, that is a great book. Really, really good book. In fact, that's, yeah, really great book. Um, and then People's Styles at Work. So people have different styles at work, and if you understand their style, and you can kind of flex to be like their style, you get along better with people. Yeah, yeah. It's a great book. And here's information about my book. Um, it's on Amazon, now available in German. Um, <laughs> and then I give a free chapter on careers in project management. So if you go to careersbiotech.com, that's my shortest chapter. So you can download the chapter and see the format. And if you're interested in project management, it's a good place to go. Um, here's my contact information. I'm a recruiter in life sciences, and my email is toby at synapsisearch.com. So feel free to contact me if you have any questions. So I'd like to acknowledge the 200 industry professionals and the wonderful generosity of spirit that they spent an hour of their time with a complete stranger to talk about their careers. Special thanks to my father, who went to, John, to Hopkins, and my husband, Peter, who uh, works, works at IBM, and he kind of made sure that the it wasn't a lot of jargon in my chapters. So I want to thank you for your time, and I want to say in particular to start companies, be successful, and most importantly, when you find a cure for cancer. So thank you. Very much.